New York is a city under siege, and law enforcement appears powerless to stop it. For us that lived it, it was out of control. There were record numbers of murders, you know, into the thousands. We just forget just how unsafe things were. People knew that something needed to change. You must reaffirm the rule of law. And that gave rise to the era of mass incarceration. Soap opera has kept New Yorkers glued to their TV sets. Well, an emotional day in court for a man who's been trying for nearly three decades to clear his name after serving time for a crime he never committed. Call number five, indictment one zero one five zero of ninety one. John so I was in court that day. It was really incredibly emotional. The judge was crying. John Bunn was crying. His whole family was crying. I, you know, had to choke back tears just watching this emotional moment. I'm an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man, Your Honor, and I thank you so much for what you have done to me and saved my life and my family life. And the judge grabs John Bunn's hands and, you know, she says to him, We were 14 at the time. It shouldn't have happened. And I know that you will go on with life and do something productive. And I pray that you will. So it was an incredible moment. It's a great day, and finally freedom is here for John. He is officially exonerated. He's exonerated. He has, it is clear. absolutely yeah. gone. It is nullified. John's story started when he was just 14 years old. He was at home eating cereal with his mom when the police come and knock on the door. A manhunt is on for a pair of robbers who gunned down two off-duty correction officers in Crown Heights, Brooklyn today. He was accused in the shooting of two correction officers. Police say the two gunmen forced the officers from their car, shot them, and then stole the car. While one of the officers received only minor injuries, the other was shot several times in the chest and is in critical condition. And one of those correction officers died. His trial only lasted for one day. Jury selection, opening statements, closing arguments, verdict in one day. When I was 14 years old, I always thought that being I was innocent, that the system was going to fix this by itself. And it didn't. As incredible as his story is, unfortunately, it's the system we have, and John Bunn is not the only one. Two hundred one New Yorkers have been imprisoned in the last 25 years for crimes they didn't commit. Two men who spent decades in prison exonerated today. Shame on those individuals that did this to me. The Brooklyn DA's office told me it's vacated 22 convictions since 2014. The Brooklyn man was officially cleared of wrongdoing. Right now, the DA's office is looking into at least 100 other cases. My name has finally been cleared and justice has been done. Gentlemen, what is wrong with the system? How can this be? 21 people just in the past few years from the Brooklyn DA's office have been set free because they were wrongfully convicted. How could this happen in this day and age? We have to look back at New York City in the 1990s. It was a time when crime rates were soaring and there was a lot of pressure on detectives and on prosecutors to get these convictions. I, I think it's important to look at what society was doing. And one of the things that started happening in the mid to late 1980s was the rise of the crack epidemic. 485 Alabama Avenue. At 7.05 p.m., police arrived to find this unimaginable filth. These are the caps to the crack bottles, the plastic bottles. Despite frequent visits by police, this building in East Harlem remains a major crack center for the metropolitan area. The menace of crack cocaine 85 smashed this city in the face. What we're seeing here is just a, a flood of drugs coming into this city 
which is far beyond our capacity to deal with. The drugs were a big problem. The narcotic scourge continues to grow. Especially crack. Uh, it, it was so accessible. The supply is high, officials say. Street prices are down and use is up. The high was it so intense that people became violent on it. Crack, even more than any other drug, causes violent and erratic behavior. Here were dope fiends who were like 24-7 robots, constantly looking for a fix. Crazed addicts on a cocaine high are choking hospital emergency rooms. The lack of beds forcing some mental patients to sit for days. Now, you had these crack monsters and crack dealers. So that's what caused the crime to escalate. Deborah Johnson says that ever since the crack dealers moved in six months ago, life on Dean Street has been hell. Me, my mother, my whole family, we would we couldn't really sleep at night. I'd have to sleep with one eye open, one eye closed, always listening, every little noise. You have to check and see what's going on. I covered the crack epidemic, and most of it was decimating the inner city, the housing projects. Drugs, 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 that's all the neighborhood is, drugs, full of drugs. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Lafayette Garden housing projects in Brooklyn, New York. You can just imagine, man, um, every day um, there was violence. There's always shootouts here, always. We had shootouts daily. People were shot constantly. Whether it was uh, you seeing somebody shot or, you know, drugs being sold in the corner. Gangs would uh, get their turf. Who was going to sell crack on this corner or that corner? On your block, are there a lot of dealers? Well, I don't allow that on my block. Meet the king of 117th Street the king of crack. What do you do? Well, you do what you gotta do. You, like I said, you're making a living. If you got to hurt somebody, you hurt somebody. Between 1985 and 1990, I covered a crack-related murder every day. In urban areas, drug-related violence is out of control. My mother once asked me, will you ever cover anything other than murders? And it seemed like maybe I wouldn't. It seems as the drug trade flourishes, so will its byproduct of violence and death. I would like to know, what could we do about the drugs? Killing our young folks, one by one. At that time, it was such a feeling of desperation. You can't get crack out the building. You can't, the cops can't, nobody can. Cops didn't know what to do. Can Kenny and other crack kings be stopped? No way. Because if you put me out, somebody else coming. And it'll go on and on and on. Crack is here to stay, like they say. One of the most enlightening and exciting experiences I've had in a long time was the day I spent with two of New York City's finest. And while we were patrolling their area, we talked about what it's like for a New York cop to have to confront the criminal justice system. What frustrations do you feel as police officers, and, and what can you do as police officers with the criminal justice system? Anything? Nothing. Well, you said flat, nothing like that. So they're dealing in a criminal justice system in which they're arresting some of the worst of the worst. In 72 hours, they're back in the street. After they're arrested, they really don't go anywhere. They just get back out and uh, nothing really happens. That must be disheartening. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Back then, when you locked somebody up, you would be in central booking for two days. Crime was out of control. Officers on patrol admitted to us today they sometimes feel like they're fighting a losing battle. I'm really down right now. Um, you know, I, I find it difficult going out here and, uh, and thinking clearly. South Jamaica, Queens was a very troubled area. It's rough to grow up in this neighborhood. You, know, you learn how to survive in this neighborhood. How's it to be a cop in this neighborhood? Rough. Rough, tough, <laughs> scary, you know. They scared every day. One of the cases that stands out for me is in 1988, there was a young rookie cop that was guarding the home of a witness. The fancy cars are still fixtures outside the 40s projects, the South Jamaica building where a cop's murder was planned. Four guys were paid $8,000 by a jailed drug enforcer to go take a cop, any cop. He was to become a message on February 26th, 1988. So they went up upon this patrol car, and one of them distracted him, waving from the passenger side of the car by the window. And while the officer was distracted, he was shot five times at close range in his head. Officer Edward Burns was killed because he wore a blue uniform, because the uniform stands in the way of total lawlessness. 
It was brutal. He was 22 years old. His birthday had just been five days before. He was six months on the job. Police believe Byrne was executed in cold blood on orders from a major drug dealer who was behind bars. I believe the message that they were trying to get across is that you are locking up drug dealers and that we're going to take out a symbol of the people that are making the arrest. And when that happened, that's when the city said, we have to do something. It's a terrible day for officers all over in New York, and it just doesn't seem to stop. To these men in blue, the shooting of Officer Edward Byrne is a case of good guy versus bad guy. Once you kill a cop, it's, if you think you're gonna get away with it, you're out of your mind. There was really profound anger at this time. Sure makes me angry. I'm sure it makes a lot of people angry. People knew that something needed to change. Only a massive national commitment of resources has any hope of stabilizing the situation. President Bush at the time had retired this cop, Edward Burns, badge in the White House and declared war on drug gangs. Americans have a right to safety in and around their homes. And we won't have safe neighborhoods unless we're tough on drug criminals, much tougher than we are now. That was a great impact on the city because it leveled the playing field. 200 narcotic cops stormed through 160th Street in Upper Manhattan tonight. They were really taking an aggressive approach to arrest people. Dozens of uniformed and undercover officers flooded the area. There was this war against crime, war against drugs. The raid was designed to leave a message. We're gonna get these mutts, and hopefully very soon. Now cops could be cops. Everybody understood the rules. Zero tolerance. Make it clear to people that if you're gonna sell drugs, you're gonna spend a lot of time in jail. The mayor was on them to cut out some of this crime and they created a task force it was called TNT. The tactical narcotic squad known as TNT is given high marks for what it achieves in the war on drugs. And what happened at that point was that cops were sweeping people in communities. They would come in vans and just take everybody to jail that was in the neighborhood. Listen, we locked up bad guys that killed bad people. Police could have continued to arrest people here throughout the evening. But after a while, they simply ran out of handcuffs. The mayor would say, well, go out, lock them up again, lock them up again. According to the Legal Aid Society, the horror show begins here. Arrested suspects, presumed innocent, spend up to five days in police holding pens without a judge reviewing the charges. Forget about the presumption of innocence. There's a presumption of guilt. The judge looks up and says, there's another guilty person in front of me. Let's get it done. We all know the person's guilty. They wouldn't been here. Sometimes that means tougher penalties. But more often, it just means punishment that is swift and certain. It was just much easier to just get these cases in and out of court. Make them do 10 years hard time. Stick them in one of these jails where they have to walk with their back to the wall for fear of what's going to happen to them. Bad guys doing bad things got convicted but some really good guys just minding their business got convicted. Mr. Brenda, to say that I'm sorry for what you have endured would be an understatement and grossly inadequate, but I say it to you anyway. Well, the David Ranta case opened up the floodgates. A judge vacated 58-year-old David Ranta's conviction when a key witness recanted her story. People didn't know what to make of it, um, except it was very clear that David Ranta was in it. Sir, you are free to go. <laughs> a sigh of relief and emotions running high when the shackles and handcuffs came off. David Ranta's case really opened up a lot of people's eyes that perhaps something was going on in New York City. Perhaps there are some people who are sitting in prison who don't deserve to be there. This is overwhelming. Do you have any one thing you want to do? Yeah. Uh, get the hell out of here, maybe. Thank you. Let's go. It was still another bloody night in the streets of New York City. At some point, people in New York City decided that crime was their biggest concern. Before the city's night of violence was over, seven people were murdered. These crimes were horrible crimes. An unprecedented series of violent crimes that have gripped so many New Yorkers with fear. A token booth is blown up, or this rabbi is killed.
57-year-old Rabbi Haskell Versberger was gunned down near his home in what police say is a robbery attempt. When a religious leader from any community is killed, obviously it strikes a very deep chord. Among the Hasidic community, there is anger following the shooting of one of their best loved leaders. And so there was a lot of pressure on the prosecutors for a conviction. He's now a free man after spending more than two decades in prison for the murder of a Williamsburg rabbi. The David Ranta case unraveled it all. The case against Ranta had holes from the beginning. He was forced into a confession, uh, given a script pretty much to sign, saying that he killed this rabbi and he wasn't even there. But the lead detective stands behind his work and the arrest. I didn't do anything wrong. I stand by my investigation and um, I don't know what else to tell you. Fortunately, two weeks later, it was in the newspaper that David Ranta conviction was overturned and that Detective Lewis Scarcella, the same detective that framed me, had framed Ranta. Now, Derek, you were one of those who was really convicted based on the on the investigation by a detective out in Brooklyn, former Detective Lewis Scarcella. Detective Lewis Scarcella was a bad apple. Controversial NYPD Detective Lewis Scarcella, whose career has come under scrutiny for shoddy police work in homicide cases, handled the Hamilton case. He immediately said to me that he had five witnesses who identified me as a murderer. So once the district attorney looked into that case, it raised a red flag and he said, hey, I need to open up more of these uh, Detective Lewis Scarcella cases. Well, nine people have been exonerated so far based on his uh, illegal activities and arresting the wrong person. They're investigating a hundred of his cases. In John Bunn's case, Scarcella played a role in um, fingering him as a suspect. And he said, um, congratulations, it's your lucky day you got picked. And my life changed forever after that day. To me, he was driven by closing cases. He was driven by being a star in the New York City Police Department at anyone's expense. Scarcella was able to arrest people based on no evidence. He was able to make false confessions. He admitted on the stand that he had no supervisor, that he can go to crime scenes and do whatever he wanted to do. And nobody got suspicious of any of that stuff because what he was doing was what people wanted him to do. I've seen him, great detective. Look at his record, it's impressive. On a whole, if you have a great detective or a squad working on a case, we all can't be wrong. As much as we talk about Detective Scarcella and people are quick to point a finger at him, we also have to talk about all of the prosecutors. Brooklyn District Attorney Charles Hines didn't seem phased by the heat, but that's what he's getting from the New York City Police Department. Oh, D.A. Hines. <laughs> D.A. Hines was the Brooklyn District Attorney forever. Police brass say they warned Hines' office about possible police corruption while he was a special state prosecutor but claim Hines never pushed for a probe. What role did Charles Hines possibly play in it? I think Ken Thompson, before he passed away, was really involved in trying to answer that question. The Brooklyn DA's office is in crisis. We can't have innocent men going to prison for murders that they didn't commit. And that's, what, that's what's been happening in that office under Joe Hines. We knew that Charles Hines had to go no matter who went in. So we joined forces with Ken Thompson. This is the 11th conviction that your office has overturned since you've become the district attorney for Brooklyn. Mario, we have about 100 more of these cases to look at. He was serious uh, in investigating all of the, the trials in which Garcella had participated. I'm someone who feels very strongly that we must support the police, but we must also hold the police accountable. Guys like Detective Scarcella and all the retired detectives, their view is, hey, you declared a war on crime. We fought the war on crime. We won the war on crime. Listen, don't get me wrong. That old thing of, I'm gonna join the police and save the world. <laughs> That's a lot of crap. You just do one, if you help a little, at least if we all helped a little, it's a lot. Nearly 300 people were murdered in the boroughs in 2017. So the question is, how did the safest big city in the country become even safer just last year? 
And now it's gotten so great in New York City, it is indeed the safest big city in America. A generation ago, an average of six New Yorkers were killed every day here in New York City. The crime rate has been steadily plummeting since the 1990s. Crime has now fallen so far in New York, it just doesn't appear as a major issue. The last time we had this few murders was 1951. In 1951, the Dodgers were playing at Ebbets Field. And so things have changed, and that's great. But this battle is perennial, and the world is not always turning toward the morning. You still have a justice system. We still have checks and balances. We still should do everything right. So we don't just throw people behind bars because we're outraged because the number of murders are up. This was a crime. And, and in a larger sense, this was an atrocity. It's so easy to send people from communities that are underrepresented and are disempowered to prison, to do wrong by them in any variety of ways. Who's in Rikers Island? It's 92% people of color in New York City. Who's in New York State prisons? It's the same thing. I mean, if we treat everybody the way we want to be treated, then we wouldn't be sending, you know, our sons and daughters out, out to prison for uh, minor offenses. We should start by treating everybody the way you want to be treated. Human beings should be treated like human beings. It's a systemic problem. It's the culture of that time that created uh, a, a way where innocent people can be locked up and convicted of something they didn't do. It took 27 years, and it took the Exoneration Initiative, and it took a lot of praying, it took a lot of God, and it took a lot of my mother having my back. And I don't know how I made it this far, but I feel like I'm here for a purpose and I'm gonna keep pushing for a purpose. Amen.